disclosure, uh, no fire. Um, but that's okay, we're gonna get some warmth in the room. Um, so we're gonna um, welcome uh, two Alans to the stage, but I'm gonna give them a little bit more than just the name Alan, uh, because they've got some amazing and unique background. So first up, I'd love to welcome uh, Alan Feldenkris, who is the Executive Director of Marketing and Branding at NPR. Alan has got one of the best backgrounds I've read about for a long time and heard about. He's worked on the agency side, he's now worked on the brand side, and what a brand like NPR in an election year to have someone come up and welcome. Please welcome Alan to the stage. Thank you. Good to meet you. Good to see you. Now, full disclosure, I believe Alan and Alan work together at some point. Is that correct? So you guys go way back, as they say. Yeah. Next up, we're going to welcome Alan Shulman to the stage. He's the National Director uh, of Brand, Creative, and Content Marketing at Deloitte Digital. This is a, a unique position where we've got one of those big consulting shops now with a creative in a very senior role. So I'm very excited to welcome Alan to the stage as well. Thank you, Duncan. OK. Welcome, everyone. Um, is it the Dina, Duncan, and Dana show, yes. or is it the Alan and Alan show? <laughs> yeah. We were having trouble coming up with topics for fireside chats, and so I told Duncan, why don't we just make it a prerequisite that each person has to be named Alan, and then we'll figure it out. And that's what happened. Well, the fire's so, good. So. Yeah. OK, so Alan Schulman, we'll start with you. Um, you recently moved to Deloitte Digital from the agency side. Right. And so can you tell me a little bit about that transition and, and you know, the meaning of what is a digital, for a digital marketing firm? A digital marketing Con firm? Consulting firm, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so for those of you who don't know, Deloitte Digital is the agency that sits beneath Deloitte Consulting. Um, unlike most consulting firms that just sort of land a strategy on your desk and say goodbye and send you a bill. We actually implement the strategies of our, of our partners uh, above us on the consulting side. So that's what's unique about our particular offering. I think for me personally, having spent the first 15 years of my career making television commercials and traditional um, campaigns and then moving to the digital side about 15 years ago, I think that um, while the, you know, sort of the palette and the tactics that became associated with digital marketing, got you know, more infinite and, and, and sort of more compounded. It wasn't as easy to hit as many people, so as fragmentation can, you know, uh, increase, right. all, of us are doing, all of us are doing 17 to 25 things instead of making you know, a commercial and a print ad. So I think for me, what compelled me after uh, serving as chief creative officer of Sapient for the last three years to, to move over to the consulting side was just getting deeper into the client's business and really thinking more about driving business outcome than driving what was gonna either be on the Super Bowl or how we were gonna draft off the Super Bowl. Because I think you know, anybody, all of you in this room are smart enough to know that you're only, you're only as deep into your client's business as they allow you to right. be. And if you don't own the strategy, um, which many agencies don't anymore, you don't really have a, an opportunity to affect, the, to, to affect right. the business. So for me, it was more about getting further upstream and being able to actually go arm in arm with the CMO um, into the C-suite and just, just getting more exposure to driving business outcome, not just driving creative execution. So and how did you make that shift in conversation to drive business outcomes with your C-suite? Well, I think if any of us have spent enough time in the business, you just, you just start talking more strategically. Yeah. Um, you have to understand uh, more about strategy than we ever have before because it's not so much about the idea strategy, it's about what's the business strategy? What's the business outcome you're trying to affect? So if we go in with that question as opposed to what campaign are we working on now, um, which is a very sort of narrow tactical slice of things, if you go in asking the question, what is the business outcome we want to affect? Then you can reverse, you know, you can sort of reverse engineer out of that. And content is there and creative is there and all the things I used to do are there. It's just you're starting with a, a very higher, a higher level question. And are there new challenges with that shift in conversation that you have now to business outcomes with your clients? Sure, absolutely. I mean, we all discussed yesterday when we got here, clients are, uh, marketers are buying spreadsheets or at least CFOs are as much as they're right. buying ideas. And to the second point you just made on what makes good content, right. the distance between something that's emotional and something that drives a return is sometimes a long period, right? Right. So the art of it for us at Deloitte is to be able to say and put things in a framework that you know can simply say, here are the things you can look for immediately, 
And here's, you know, here are the things that are gonna return, and here are the things that you're gonna need to invest in. Because emotionally, we still have to move people. Right. And programmatic creative, at least none that I've seen, is really moving anybody yet. Right. And from an emotional standpoint. Right. So I gotta, I gotta come in on this. Like, the strategy sure. question, every agency I know wants to believe they own strategy. Mm -hmm. The reality is, they don't. they don't. And they don't often have the conversation. Some do, some don't, it depends on the relationship. Very relationship driven. Are you saying because now you're within that Deloitte different way to present yourself, you can really own that conversation with the client or is it still relationship driven with the client at the right level? So it's both, okay. right? The question is if you're a CMO and you're trying to translate for the rest of the C-suite what you're doing and why it's not discretionary spend, are you better off with your agency on your arm or are you better off with Deloitte on your arm? And I, I came to the conclusion that for me, the ability to get upstream was going to be easier um, relying on my partners on the consulting side to be able to have an impact on the business. That was a subjective decision I would made. I wouldn't say it's objective in all cases. But you, and you see different, different outcomes depending on the CMO, depending on the business That's environment, right. depending on the business objective. So that the agency still could own some of the strategy, yeah. but it's, very, it's that relationship. Yeah, I mean, look, there are plenty of great agencies, BBDO, Ogilvy, that, that have still very, very strong relationships with their clients. The truth is that the premise used to be, if you own the strategy, you own the relationship. Right. And there are very few agencies that actually own the strategy. So that leads me to my next question. Like, is there a difference if you're, if you're focused on digital work versus brand strategy? Is there a difference in what you can own strategically if you're focused more of a digital agency outlook versus, an, you just mentioned like, Brand agencies. To me. Yeah, I, th I think that the whole d digital agency thing is. Someone gonna, got very upset about that it yesterday. It's going to be over. I think. Anymore. I think we're just digital. We're right? all agencies. No Especially the age of specialty <laughs> digital agencies. I think is if it hasn't gone away, it's going away. Um, all right, I won't so, mention okay. that again. But, no, that's okay. I'd say, I, I'm not as virulent <laughs> as, as the others, but um, about that. Okay, I wanted to go to Alan. Sure. The other Alan. Other Alan. That, that okay, works. so in your role at NPR, can you tell me a little bit about your transition from the agency side to NPR, and then what are some of the challenges that you face in your current role? Well, I, I would say that the, the transition part was, for me personally, was relatively easy because I, I wasn't uh, necessarily looking to move to the client side. I mean, I had done the uh, agency and marketing services Work long enough where that I was uh, enjoyed quite quite you know I enjoyed it quite a bit you know but once once maybe twice maybe three times if you're really lucky in your career your personal passions will line up with your professional right. uh, acumen and your professional capabilities and for me it was simply a fact that you know I had been a you know lifelong or at least adult long listener. <laughs> to NPR and its content way, going way back. And when the opportunity came to be able to try to lead them going forward from a marketing, from a brand stewardship standpoint, from an audience development and audience reach standpoint, for me it was a no-brainer. Right. It, it was a no-brainer. And it's a fascinating time because you know we're a 45-year-old, primarily a news organization. But NPR, if you're familiar, or if you listen, or if you download our podcast, if you listen to any of our applications, we continue to expand under a very simple premise, which is to create amazingly compelling content and make it available for people regardless of where they are. Right. So we have a lot of wonderful terrestrial product which goes out that you probably listen to in your car or at home on your local uh, NPR member station. We have uh, applications like the NPR News app, which can allow you to live stream, or NPR One, which I would love for everybody in this room to download if they can before they go home and find me and let me know what you think about it in the days to come, which is a new kind of customized way to experience public radio. We even have uh, kind of the third leg of the stool, which is our, our, our physical and events business, where now, more than ever, NPR is going out with our leading journalists and creating live journalistic events with people like David Green, who's host of our Morning Edition show, or Michelle Martin, who's one of our leading journalists. We're going out into the field in audiences like this, having town hall discussions. They're very journalistic, but they raise a lot of issues. And at the end of the evening, if you go to one of these events, people are like, that was interesting. Right. It wasn't a lecture. It wasn't a presentation. It wasn't really a talk. It was just a really cool NPR experience. So. For us, we're at this a bit of an inflection point now where 
it's not just about news. It's about this, if you will, this kind of sonic need, sonic obsession that people have after they listen to NPR programming over time that we're really trying to capitalize on. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the term driveway moment, but if you're an NPR fan at all, you've probably found yourself at one time or another in your car, in your driveway, not going inside because right. you really want to hear the end of the story. And it could be a story, or it could be a Saturday afternoon you're listening to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, or you could be listening to you know, Radio Lab, or you could be listening to a number of different things, and we're really trying to capitalize on our ability to do that, create that great content, and make it available for people wherever they are. Right. So the average listener on NPR for the terrestrial radio is 45 or above? You're getting there. Okay. Yeah. It's a, and, it's, yeah. and so what are you doing to bring in those younger audiences? You know, you, and tell, talk to me about the impact of terrestrial radio and then streaming. Yeah. So we're doing a few things. The first thing you want to do is on your terrestrial product, there's no question, you know, NPR started 45 years ago, and the listeners, when we were covering things like the Vietnam War and the Watergate hearings, we were... Uh, they were a young, feisty, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and now they're, now they're older and feisty, right? right? And, but what's interesting is that the content itself is actually quite elastic. The content moves quite nicely. Now, if you think about a show like All Things Considered, which is our news magazine, which runs, which runs weekdays in the afternoon, the hosts have been there for quite a while and cover a wide range of things. So we have Audie, Audie Cornish and Robert Siegel. We had Melissa Block until until last year, and they could cover everything from, you know, remote broadcasts when Robert himself went down to Cuba to talk about the changing society, all the way ranging from the premiere of some new music that Audie might bring us. We've, we've expanded that lineup to be more youthful. We have Ari Shapiro, we have Kelly McEver, so, so they bring a, a, a greater youthful emphasis, but the basic right. content doesn't change. They're just able to bring a little bit more what I would say a little bit more youthful tone. So for example, Kayla McEvers interviewed Dweezil Zappa, the son of the late great Frank Zappa, in a way that you could just feel her fandom for his music. Last week, Ari Shapiro interviewed a tattoo artist in Toledo who in his spare time when he's not working, um, gives tattoos that cover up scars from people who are, have been uh, abused or have been in uh, harmful cutting. That's wonderful. You know, and, and it was just like such an amazingly wonderful piece of content that it's still happening in our terrestrial broadcast, but it's becoming broader and rounder. Then, if, again, if you think about kind of how we're reaching our younger audiences through platforms, you've got a whole generation of folks out there, digitally native folks, who get in their vehicles and don't turn on the car radio. My son, when he started driving, right. he, 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 I, 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 want, I got in his car one day and I turned on the radio and there was classical music at playing. I was just like, all right. And I said, yeah. boy, son, that's pretty impressive. He goes, oh, no, Dad, I, I, don't, I don't listen to the radio. I just, that's kind of the default. And I just put plug in <laughs> the auxiliary. Right. right? And, 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 and away he goes. So we're try, we have to reach them you know, through streaming options and through apps so that right. they can, you know, a, a brand like NPR, the cornerstone of NPR is built on something that we call discovery. It typically happens when you go away to college, and then it happens in a second wave in your late 20s, and you get hooked. And our job is to create you know, a thousand swinging doors into the NPR world, right. however, however you get there. Right. You may come through NPR music, right? because you, know, you just know that NPR music is so on edge and so on trend. I'll tell you a quick story. My son, uh, uh, I'll use him again as a, a case study of one, I asked him when I was interviewing for the job about a year and a half ago, I said, tell me about your perceptions of NPR. He goes, well, I think it's, uh, for the most part, a lot of old white guys talking. However, <laughs> when it comes to their uh, NPR music, I don't know how they do it, but you know, when there's a new Dan Deacon release, Stereo Gum and Pitchfork both say, NPR first, listen, has it. So NPR, I don't know what they do, but, you know, and I thought, that's amazing. And then, I, of course, I had to go look up who the heck Dan Deacon was because <laughs> I didn't know at the time. But, but so, so regardless, of, regardless of kind of where you are, you need to make sure that you're creating the right type of platforms combined with the right type of content to let people come in, let people come into the brand experience. It sounds like you've got the ability, though, to kind of uh, let your history and the way you operate and your brand 
you don't have to push too far. You can almost stay on that bedrock and you can open those doors, let people come to you. It's not like you have to reinvent yourself, basically. We, to, yeah, I, I think you're correct. We, we don't have to reinvent ourselves. We have to, I think our challenge is to kind of ex, ex, ex smartly expand our footprint so that great content can reach people through a voice that will resonate with them and in a platform that's completely native to them. And it's a real interesting challenge. If you're a car company and you've been making the same vehicle for a number of years and now you have to figure out what the features and benefits that are of that car to appeal to the young people, it's one thing. For us, we not only have to do that, but the very product, if you will, the physical manifestation of how they're experiencing us is completely different than how their parents did because, again, they're not likely to be tuning in terrestrially. So we have to have, contemplate not only great content, but an entirely new set of, of hardware, if you will. But it sounds like you know, I mean, you know who you are as a brand, and that's a strength, and that's a power that you can build from. That's not what you see every day. We, li we like to think so. We're right now in the process of evolving our brand position, and the key is, the, is, is Al and I have both done a good deal of brand identity in our, in our, in our lives, and uh, the key is, is evolve and not remake. We're evolving. We're smartly evolving our brand position so that it can do all the things that we're saying that we need to, but there's no reason to kind of change the, the, the core of who we are. If I had a nickel every time I went to a conference or an event for, for you know, 25 and 27 year old, all the 25 and 27 year olds who came up to me, I said, I love NPR. Right. You know, so we don't, we don't, we, it's, it's more of an evolution of, of reach. You love your podcast too. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question for Alan Schulman. Um, with all this talk of content marketing, do you think it's going to eventually replace traditional advertising? Uh, no, I don't. I think, I think advertising is evolving. It's in a liquid state like you guys talked about earlier. But I don't, I don't think, um, as we think about content marketing, I think the evolution has been more from campaign marketers, which most of us were used to be, to being now always on, right? right. So, and always on is defined, I think, content marketing has become a surrogate for what always on is. That means we've got social people creating content, we have brand teams creating content, we have web people creating content, and I think the act of content marketing is looking over all those things in sort of a macro sense, and I know we have somebody from GE here, GE here right. who's gonna speak later. I think I, I admire greatly how they do it. You know, sort of look over that in a macro sense and say, you know, not so much based on the funnel, as you said, the funnel's been crushed. So it isn't so much about what content for what part of the funnel, it's more about, you know, do we have a, a, a sort of a large view of what we're messaging? Right. Um, and how, what of that content is evergreen through the year? What of that content is sort of, you know, around events or key things that we sponsor? And then what things are designed to halo a TV flight? Because right. there's still advertising going on and there's still flights going on, as we, as we heard yesterday in the 70-20-10 conversation. So. What's your view on programmatic advertising? So I think, you know, I think we're putting the plumbing ahead of the poetry there. Uh, I think that the plumbing is there, but the creative's not there. Yeah. Um, and I think that the work that we have to do as an industry, all of us, whether we're on the marketing side or the creative side, we've got to figure out what good looks like in a one-to-one -one messaging right. world. Because algorithms don't feel, people feel. And as a, as a person who's been a chief creative officer for the last you know, dozen years of my life, um, I can honestly say we haven't cracked it yet. Right. You know, we can get, we've got all the data sets to tell us, back to your point, we've got all the discrete data sets to, to inform the creative. But like yourself, I'm more moved by generative data visualization than I am by any programmatic creative yeah. that I've seen come up and gone, wow, that's incredible. I think there's some incredible examples that we've seen in pockets of excellence such as what Madden did with the Giferator last year with Google, um, where everybody was able to create an individual piece of smack talk right. against an individual athlete for an individual person. I think we're starting to see things surface where we can take data and we can take tools and give them either to consumers um, or that we can hopefully get to some level of what we call addressability at scale, and I know that's, that's kind of right. a mouthful for a creative guy, <laughs> but addressable creative at scale, I, I think we're still a long way off from knowing how, to your point on your last slide, yeah, how are totally we gonna agree. emotionally what, move people? What do you think's holding us back there? Well, it's, it's sort of a, a, you know, we can't have algorithms write headlines. Right. 
We can give it business rules about what time of day it is, what zip code you're in, what the weather's like, what kind of car are you driving. That's all great that we can point cast that information. But don't forget, we need the North Star idea, as we've said, right. that emotionally moves you, right? And I think if we don't start from what the North Star is, right. then you know it, it's sort of like all we're serving you is a bundle and a price yes. at the lower end of the funnel, and that's not going to move anybody. So, so um, it might move your 0.7 to 2 percent on your on your direct response metrics, but it's not going to do what the craft of television has been able to do, or the craft of great radio right. has always enabled us to do, which is move people emotionally. That's why I'm so jealous. <laughs> you know, Alan gets to have like a an enormous library of awesome content that you know any of you who have been on NPR.org. I mean, you can you can lose yourself in a rabbit hole. Uh, on NPR and just keep finding more and more content that you want. Right. For those of us on the agency side, that's the hardest thing to do, right. is to find evergreen content that will be as sticky as what you know a content-based company or your company exactly. is in the act of doing. Yeah. So that's the, that's the hard part. Right. I think going back to what you said about programmatic <clears throat> and not resonating or, or not having the creative to the poetry and the, and the plumbing, I think another part is just the sheer workload. You know, having all these different versions of creative for all these micro segments right. of the target that it's, you identify, it's and dizzying. it's just a sheer workload issue. It's dizzy. You know? Are we supposed to have cafeteria tables full of copywriters <laughs> or community managers writing <laughs> right. writing d individual headlines for thousands of people? Right. I can't see what that looks like. Exactly. Yet I do know that I don't think algorithms are going to be able to to write those. Right. But, but what I would ask all of us is, aren't we afraid of what we're moving towards, which is the science of creative, knowing that that may not move people in the way that we, as much as we like to diss the madmen, who were my bosses when I grew up in the right. business, um, you know, much as we, wanna, we like to diss them and cliche them now, they were very much craftsmen at behavioral economics, yeah. Yeah. not finite economics. And we, we seem to be wanting to turn creative into a finite kind of economics and science. And I think that we've got to remind ourselves that the plumbing and the poetry have to right. live side and by if side. If I could just jump on yes, that. Yes, please. One, one of the things that I'm concerned about is, is you know, and, and, and we're involved with acquisition campaigns, uh, you know, for, for some of our app-based products. And, you know, what I'm a little bit concerned about, and I, and I know I will have to rely on some type of you know, analytic-driven programmatic solutions. But what I'm concerned about is that, you know, if we're, if we're so hasty in bundling and gathering as quickly as we can for as low a price as we possibly can dump everything into the top of that funnel, then I'm nervous about the quality of the customers that we're bringing in. And right. so I think that I like the way, and, and I look forward to stealing it, Alan's line about uh, plumbing and poetry. So thank you for that. But you know, the, the idea that we, we, we want to throw everything in, you know, if, I'm the, if, if, I'm, if I'm asking each of you to download NPR One, and ultimately my success measure is what we call your, my net 30-day active user, which are the people that you know, every, most of the people probably know in this room that app abandonment um, is massive and quick. The ability to have a loyal user continuing to interact with your experience 30 days after is much, much harder. In my rush to get as many um, new users as possible through the programmatic landscape, I will dump a lot of garbage into the top of the funnel. And that's my fear. Right. So I have to find a way to do both. And so I like what you said in a previous slide, in your previous discussions, that you have to start with the big idea. And if right. my agency isn't starting with a big, fat, juicy, benefit-driven <laughs> idea, then uh, it makes me very nervous. Right. What do you think the future of media agencies are? Of media agencies? Yeah. So I, I, I think they're in, a, they're in a very tough position right now. And I think that is because um, we, uh, let, let's back up from media specific. We unbundled media from creative. That was the first big mistake we made. And we, and, and we made that decision based on Money. trying to get right. you know, efficiency for Procurement. clients, yeah. efficiency for clients in buying power. But when we divorced the creative process from the media process, we, we took away the ability for us to collaborate. And we all know that cross-functional collaboration, no matter what discipline you come from, yields better results because there's proximity there. Right. So the fact that I can't go up the elevator like I could at McCann and sit down with the 
with the media department and say, what do you guys think of this, right? And where would you put it? The fact that we can't have that, that we have to have a, a, an integrated conversation where the client has to bring nine agency partners into a room right. and do that. And maybe you'll get the same people in the room two times at two meetings, and maybe it'll be a completely <laughs> different cast of characters the next time you show up for that meeting. That's what makes it tough. So answering the media question then, once we unbundled, the value that they brought to the table was their buying clout. Right. Now then they have to add planning insight, and then they have to add ideas onto that and the way they leverage media spend in branded content. Right. A lot of those branded content ideas, as many of you know, there have been some great ones, but they're mostly one and done. It's like, what do you do in year two? What do you do in year three? Right. After you've done a, a branded content partnership with a network or, or a magazine or whatever. So what's the sustainable idea there? Hopefully, if back to Alan's point, right. if you have a North Star, you know how to keep rolling that out. I think they're gonna be, in the age of programmatic, they're gonna be seriously challenged right. as more marketers bring trading desks in-house. I think by the time we see the third or fourth major advertiser or marketer bring a trading desk in-house, I think you're gonna hear a tree fall in the woods. And right. I think uh, my fear is that then for them, where is their leverage? Right. Their leverage was always in their buying cloud. So my hope is that, um, and you know, at Deloitte, we're not, we're not in that business. But I would say that you know the, the, the challenge for the media agencies is at the percentage of commission that they're making, which is very little, right. how can they afford the ideas, the insights, the senior level talent to be able to really get stuck in and as I said earlier, drive business outcome, right. not just channel spend. Right. And I think that's they're where really they're, stretched that's thin. where they're yeah. challenged. Yes. Um, so tell me a little bit about the internal structure at Deloitte and how your teams are structured. So, as I said, we sit beneath the consultancy, right. and they, they're engaged on strategy roadmaps and strategy assignments that normally are much bigger than just marketing, right? Because, right? you know, look, let's all face it, we're in the customer experience business now, right? We're not just in the marketing as campaign. It, it, it ladders up from user experience all the way up to customer experience. If you're a CMO and you are responsible for the customer experience metric, that means the call center. That also means the e-commerce site. That can mean lots of things that are outside traditional marketing, right? And we know that different flavors of CMOs have different buckets of responsibility, and there's lots of swim lanes to cross if a CMO doesn't own the e-commerce site but owns the customer experience metric. So what we try to do at Deloitte is because we have a, you know, usually a horizontal presence across our clients right. where we're interfacing with the COO and the CFO, and, and I'm inter interfacing with the CMO, usually what we try to do is bring those, break down those swim lanes um, for CMOs to be able to say, you know, let's look holistically at the customer experience metric. How can we affect that, not only through the communications, but through the user experiences, and how do we affect that in the physical environment as well? That's a big task, right? right? And it's, it's hard to coordinate. That's and, 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 and it's where we're going, as, a, as marketing evolves, but that's a really tough thing to pull off. That's exactly where I was going. I, I completely agree with this notion of us being in the customer experience business. That's, right. that's really well said. But how many clients are ready for that? Isn't there, isn't there a big, big problem there that they're not thinking in those time of integrated ways? Because I don't know many CMOs that run call centers. I know a few, but not as many as perhaps that they should do. Right. So I think that that's, I think if they aren't, they're knowing that customer experience is it, the experience is the brand. And, and as much as communications is the brand, the experience is also the brand. So I think getting their arms around all the things that that means are tough to do. And if we can be an ally to break down some of the swim lanes that exist at the enterprise level, then we'll break those swim lanes down so that we can help them get a more holistic look at how to get a customer experience metric going or, or what we'd call return on experience. Right, which is a metric we haven't seen yet. We've all yeah. been very ROI focused, but return on experience, how do we define that? I'm what writing that, that one look, down. Actually. What does that look good. like, right? So I think that's what we're thinking about at Deloitte Digital is what does a return on experience metric look like? And, 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 and does that need to align with a, a media channel uh, metric? Probably not. It's probably got to be some different kind of metric. So I think that's the challenges that we're, that we're facing and what's different about Deloitte. Right, great. 
Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you interact with your agencies and what a successful client agency partnership might look like these days? Yeah, for, for me, um, I, I, I like to say, you know, first of all, lead me. Don't, get, don't give me anything for free, particularly if you're, particularly if you're, you're bidding on an assignment. Um, I, I don't expect, um, I don't expect reams of spec work. I don't expect to, uh, you know, to not pay for what you might normally charge somebody. But if you're going to bring me some ideas to, because you want my business, I need to understand more than basically the people, your case study, your capabilities, and the awards that you've won, and you know, really great pictures of kind of the office environment. Those are all kind of green spies, if you will, at the bottom of the of the brand pyramid, if you will. However, bring me some ideas that will at least show me that you have, A, spent some time thinking about my business, B, that you actually grasp it. So for those of us who have been in the agency business, we know that there's a big difference between kind of studying up on a business and then kind of turning the corner to kind of getting that business and to understanding that brand. So show me that you've got people in your organization that have a have, have kind of have spent enough time and have have enough smarts and insights and wherewithal to get it. So then, if you show me, for instance, if you're if you're we just went through a recent pitch, somebody showed me some really interesting segmentation that they had done as a way to think about our our younger audience base. Whether it was right or completely spot on was far less important to me than the fact that it was insight rich, that there was rigor there, and that there was a lot of belief in it, right? And so I'm always looking for agencies to let me, you know, to, again, I don't, want to, I don't want stuff for free up front, but lead me. Now, also, don't be afraid to tell me what you can't do. And again, I, 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 you know, from my former life when I was constantly pitching and selling and working on large new business pitches, you know, we always had a tendency to kind of if it was going to have a real tough impact on the internal resourcing, if we weren't going to be able to get stuff done, if how many times have we walked out of a, a, a new business pitch and said, that's amazing, and then we looked at each other and said, how the hell are we going to do that? How are we going to get that done? You know? But we're high-fiving because we had a great pitch. I'd much rather an agency be as transparent as they realistically can be about what they can and, get, get, and, and what they can't get done, because at the end of the day, I'm going to hire you as much on trust as I am on, on the power of your portfolio. We used to say in the olden days of the agencies that you get hired on creative and you get fired on service. I, don't, I, I no longer believe that. I think that these days you get hired, or at least I will hire an agency as much, as much on trust as kind of the power of their portfolio because the stakes are high, higher perhaps than they've ever been. And us as marketing leads, the, as we've all been talking about at conferences like this, it's complex, it's really hard. It's no longer five channels and done. Right. And, and so I really want to make sure that I understand that you have not only the capabilities, but the bandwidth and the right people in place to get it done, and that you'll tell me that you won't, right. if you can't. And do we just have a couple more minutes left. Um, Alan Schulman, do you have anything to add to that about what defines a successful relationship? Yeah, and, you know, I think uh, you're buying people. If you make a short list, they're prepared to buy your firm. Um, I think from there, it's about they're buying a team. And, and, and I would agree with Alan, there's no substitute for putting the people in the room who are gonna work on the business. And there's no substitute for being transparent with a client about what you're really good at. We, we have a, a, a huge list of services we offer. But when a client looks at me or, or, or and says, but what are you guys really good at? What do you shine at? You have to be willing to answer that question, right? We're Deloitte, right. you know, we're not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna, as much as I've been a chief creative officer, I'm not gonna stand up and say, creative is our strongest suit, right? Objective measurement is what the Deloitte brand right. is all about and what it's always been about. Right. So measurement, we lead, we lead with strategy and we lead with measurement as our two keyhole things and we're building creative capability and we're building obviously platform capability. We do tons of platform work, but that's more back office. It isn't, you know, a, a front, front office strategy like we do on the strategic side. So I would, I would echo what Alan said. The other thing I would advise agencies to do is, you know, in this day and age, focus, focus very much on, as Alan said, a point of view on something you're really passionate about. And if you, if you believe you can solve, I would say this is the, 
the one thing I've always done is true. Be willing to solve a client's small problem, mm. not just their large problem. That's so true. If you're willing to pay, get paid a little bit to solve a small problem, it starts the there. client will remember you and give you an opportunity to solve the large problem. But if you're only there to solve the large problem, you're probably going to have a much more limited opportunity. To That's grow a wonderful that point. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think we're out of time. Do you want? Do we have time? Questions. For questions? Does anyone have any questions that'd like to jump in for either the Allens or Dina or Duncan? All right, you're all waking up. <laughs> all right. Hey guys. Uh, Hi. Great, great panel. Great information. Uh, Ray Erickson with Conversant. Alan, question for you when you're speaking to the agency model. Um, I don't want to use your words, I'm in need of repair, it wasn't broken, but are, are you speaking more kind of holding group agency or small and nimble? Because, you know, I, I look at an agency like Horizon or the Richards Group that are massive agencies, independent, albeit, uh, but they're doing some fantastic work uh, and certainly far from broken. So can you just shed a little bit more light on the type of agencies that you're speaking to that need that, that repair? Which Alan are you speaking yeah. to this one? <laughs> this one? Yeah. That, um, that, that are in need of, what would you say, of repair? Well, what, what, I don't recall what your word was. Dina, your question was, you know. When I was asking you about media agencies and you were saying you're, they were having a tough time. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, look, I, you know, I, I can't, I, 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 I would say the model is, the media agency model is being stressed. I think I, that those media agencies that are stretching into creative, not as defined by I've got a brand content group that's gonna do a one-off with a media company. That, that's not what I mean. I mean really building out a, a, an offering that is robust and frankly some of the things that Horizon, because they're independent, have done you know, and, and always been scrappy and always been you know, able to go up against the big holding company media agency. I think that you have to think about what your offering is and how to bring value to that within the resources that you have, and I think that's where they're challenged, um, is are they getting paid enough to bring new people? Are they getting paid enough to bring new ideas to the table? And if they're not, it's where are those 10% that you can invest in growing new types of things that will help differentiate you as a media shop? And I don't mean procurement-led scale or you know, things that are gonna help you offshore stuff, because that is quickly becoming a race to the bottom. I don't think it's about things that you can do cheaper. I think it's about things that can drive deeper insights, like Alan said. Is that sort of what you're driving at? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I mean, I think, do, I do you ever see the agency model going back to a place of a true AOR, where it has media and creative that's handling both for Look, I, for I, I think there are examples of AOR relationships that are still out there. I think we're gonna still see some of those, but they're definitely declining. And as I would say before, the premise was always you know, this agency knows our brand, they know our strategy, they're intimately familiar with us, and I think those relationships still exist, although fewer and fewer and in, in more pockets than ever before. I think one of the things that I'd like to see, and I don't know if it's gonna be AOR or, or faux AOR, as we used to say, where you get kind of a, a bunch of kind of serialized assignments, you know, and we're kind of there, you know, and what is an AOR anyways, but the ability to kind of you know, work on an annual retainer, which are very few and far between, or the opportunity as an agency to say, you are my client, and oh, by the way, may I put your quilt on my website and, and reference you as such, which, which has value for an agency. What I would really love to see, and I know it's, it's an old buzzword already, but a truly, a truly integrated agency where, you know, are you digital, are you so, what, it doesn't really matter, right? Not all marketing is digital, but all business is digital. And so unless you're really integrated, unless you've got a great, are able to do everything, then you will be missing a really kind of key component on your wheel of capabilities. And that's, and that's really unfortunate. And for me, I'm as nervous about the loss of great copywriters as I am about you know, not having the right media analyst or not having the right user experience professional. Because if we don't have the great copywriter, which is kind of an old, kind of a lot of people think of it's, it's an old school that you know, kind of sits in a big agency and you know, is 40 something years old and writes television commercials, those people tend to be the stewards of the brand story that everybody else who's on that capability wheels 
jumps on That's and reacts an to. Point. And yeah. I think that so if we can, if, if the agency community, whether they're small or large, whether they're AOR or kind of project at a time, can really start to recommit to true integration, the the load the the it, it'll I tell you it'll fall hard on the account planning function, the connections planning function, and the project management function because those three functions are going to have to be so much more versed yes. and so much more adaptive perhaps than they are right now, but it, it clearly can happen and should. Yes, agreed. Hi there. Um, first of all, thank you. Great panel. I'm over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it, I'm, I'm John Ray with Cello Partners, and uh, my question uh, could be to either Alan, and I think you guys touched on this. I'd love to really get your opinion. We work with a lot of Fortune 500 clients, and we're definitely seeing that creative is taking a backseat or maybe even a, a way backseat to technology. And marketing is moving towards, you know, you have a chief marketing officer. We have clients thinking about chief technology marketing officer. And I'm just wondering, do you see this as a pendulum and it's just kind of going towards tech now? Or do you think this is the new normal and then how, what do you think about that and where that's gonna go? So I would say it's, it, it is the new normal. The worlds of marketing and technology are colliding and not just because of the plumbing, right? Because we now have data sets, as we've talked about, that are gonna enable us to message one-to-one. -one. As I said earlier, we don't know what good looks like in that category yet. We're seeing pockets of it, but not at scale yet. And we're certainly not gonna be able to program the plumbing to, to write, to do what Alan just said, great copywriters do. So it's a question of how we work that out both as marketers and as, you know, like Pepsi's trying to do it in-house, as we heard last night, there's gonna be all kinds of models for how we do that. So I think that, you know, the, the, the challenge is, you know, is generally gonna be that, is, is sort of how we, how we negotiate our way, how we teach the technologists who are systems thinkers about storytelling, and how we teach the storytellers about systems thinking. And those are the two challenges that having spent, you know, three years at Sapient Nitro, I can tell you that was a pretty great environment for technologists and storytellers coming together and being cross-functional. Because if you're a storyteller, you have to learn systems thinking, and if you're a systems thinker, you have to learn storytelling. And, and, and that takes time. It's not part of your core being. I got out of bed in the morning to write commercials for 15 years. I knew very little about technology until I went to the digital side 15 years ago. Now I can tell you the difference between a dam, a CMS, uh, a, you know, a, 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 a piece of workflow software. I, I'm very, very versed in that because I've had to become that, um, even as a chief creative officer. So I, I think it's here to stay, and I think if you haven't invested in saying, oh, that's just MarTech stuff, I don't need to worry about the plumbing, I have news for you. Take the time, invest, understand, because at global scale, if you're working for any Fortune 50 or 100 client who's trying to do things at global scale, you're gonna to need to understand the plumbing. Okay, we're uh, now short on time. I saw some more hands popping up, but fortunately we have the, uh, the Feel two Feel free Alan's. to catch us afterwards. Absolutely. Yes, and yeah, they, we'll both, be around. Uh, they both enjoy cocktails. So, that's one over one. Thank you guys. Very Thank much. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Wonderful job. Great.